idea of this session, what are our objectives? Um, World Academy of Art and Science has organized for many years different conferences on uh, education or with a very important focus on education. In the last uh, eight, uh, 10 years, the uh, organization decided to have every year, but due to the pandemic, we couldn't do every year, a conference focused just on education. And this time, the topic of this sixth conference is uh, education and human security, uh, a topic which uh, has been studied by our members for many, many years, and uh, somehow has a history started in uh, 1960, when the uh, theoretical discussions about growth, development, the limit of development, the mistakes that we are doing related to our environment, um, uh, sustainable development, and uh, somehow this uh, concept uh, evolved, and uh, we are more and more speaking today about the security, human security. And the question is how education can contribute to this topic. Um, in the last moment of uh, organizing the conference, uh, Gary, and I'm happy we have here our president, mm -hmm. uh, together with other colleagues, and also I had a contribution, we realized there are two elements that can contribute to the outcomes of the conference. The idea of the international dimension, multi multilateralism, and education, and that was a session uh, uh, which took place uh, two days ago. And the second session, which we added in the last moment, is this one, citizenship, public participation, and uh, uh, human security, because in fact, everything starts with the idea of the meaning of education, why we are educating our kids. Are we educating our kids to know math, and the history and geography and music, for sure we do, but this is not a final end. Maybe the first purpose of education is to build citizens, people, adults being able to interact in and contribute to their communities. And for this reason, we decided the component of citizenship, of public participation, uh, these are important topic when you speak about human security. How can uh, a population contribute to human security if they, are, they have not been taught to be part of community? That means citizenship. For today, I uh, invited uh, very uh, dear friends to me. Uh, I have had the pleasure to meet him during my careers. And I will start with uh, Cher Zarbirza, professor to my university, but I met him as uh, many years ago as director of the Romanian uh, Research Institute on Education uh, Science. And for 30 years, Professor Cher Zarbirza led the discussion at the Romanian and uh, I'll say European level on uh, the concept of education and dynamic of education uh, policies. Professor Berza also used to work with the Council of Europe on this very specific topic, citizenship. And uh, I will kindly invite uh, in uh, one, two minutes, Professor Berza to start, in fact, this uh, uh, session. Betsy Bowes, for many years, uh, on a uh, high level, administrator in higher education, rector, president, and also playing an important role uh, uh, globally as a member of International Association of Universities and other uh, organizations. Fernando Galvan, professor in Alcala University, former rector, and um, uh, I would say an ambassador of uh, European Union, Latin America, uh, academic relationship because he founded and led for more than eight, nine years, I think, 
the platform to catalyze the cooperation between uh, Latin America and the European uh, Union, Permanent Academic Forum, we call. Uh, will join us uh, later, I hope there will be no connection problems, um, um, Claudia Costin, former Minister of Education in a region in Brazil and um, uh, director, Senior Director for Education in the World Bank. And uh, uh, in last but not least, Ligia Deca, Romanian Minister of Education. I will kindly ask Professor Burza for eight, nine minutes to present to us his uh, views. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, we need much more time to discuss uh, this kind of issues like, like citizenship, human security, education. So I'll try to focus and concentrate on some specific aspects of this relationship between citizenship and human security, which is quite new. I, I recognize that uh, during my time with the Council of Europe, we have different approach, citizenship and social cohesion. There are, there are different wordings. So we have to clarify a bit what we are talking about. So, for that, I propose you to start from three inputs, which uh, you find uh, in all research projects devoted to, the, to this issue of citizenship, and perhaps also more recently on the new dimension on uh, human security. The first one is that uh, all rights are equally important. So there is no hierarchy of rights. This is very important to stress because in some public policies, we, we, uh, we support mostly other, other aspects as, as for, for instance, civic participation, less than uh, social rights, and even less than cultural rights. So the idea is that citizenship implies an equality of rights. And I suppose that is the same for uh, human security. By the way, in uh, my doctorate school, we, we uh, encourage a, a, new, a new paradigm uh, related to these issues, namely societal security, which is uh, promoted by the Comp Copenhagen School and uh, has to do with uh, uh, with equality and uh, diversity of, uh, uh, of securities. We have to promote not only military and violent security or non-violent uh, uh, approach, but all, all dimensions of public policies. And we see how important it is in the case of pandemia. The pandemic was, was not only a health issue. We, the whole society was disturbed by this, uh, this, uh, uh, this problem. The second uh, issue I would propose to start with is the fact that we have to promote a, a balance between rights and responsibilities. This is easy to say, but it's difficult in, to put it in practice because all our documents, particularly binding documents, stress the legal aspects and the, 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 the responsibility of the, of the state to protect citizenship rights. Uh, the fact is that in most of the national documents and in the national documents as well, like the, the UN Declaration of Human Rights and other, the Charter, European Charter of Rights, the focus is on the legal aspects, uh, the protection of human rights, because this is the imbalance between the citizens and the, and, the start, and the state. And the rights of the citizens became uh, the priority. What, what about responsibilities? Because we have to, to take care of uh, the, the moral consequences of rights. Actually, they are not they, do, do, they do, do not have the same status. 
the responsibilities are the, the moral consequence of, of, uh, of, uh, of rights. In, uh, at the end of 90s, it was uh, uh, an initiative of the in UN, the so-called Interaction Action, uh, Interaction Group, uh, composed by head of states, led by, uh, uh, by the Canadian uh, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Prime Minister. And they, their initiative was to produce a similar document with the same power as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They work almost one year on that. We, we, they involved many experts, but the outcome was quite, quite, quite horrific because the, the result was a strong emphasis on responsibilities and obligations. And the point was how to put in the, to assure the balance between rights and responsibilities. This is an open question. We, we have to promote, of course, the responsibilities, like the, the responsibility to, to participate, actually participate in, in the public sphere. And there are others which are, which are a consequence of the, of the uh, legal entitlements of the citizen. So this, this is a, 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 a question which is not solved at the international level, not at the national level, but it's kept in mind. I, uh, we, have a, we had a project in, in our doctorate school on uh, responsibilities of the elites. And we uh, promoted the, uh, we, we actually we have introduced a, a curriculum for uh, uh, social responsibility of, of leaders. And uh, we had a, face as the same problem as always in uh, the level of discourse or the level of uh, theory of the level of uh, uh, of the of the language no problems but the problem is when we have the power we have the decision making and we have uh, you have to, to to take into consideration this possible and desirable balance between rights and responsibility the third point I would like to mention is the, is, has to do with the similarities and possible interchange of experiences between education for citizenship and education for human security. Uh, if, you, if you look at the manual for education for uh, human security, produced under the umbrella of, of UN Commission for uh, Human Security, you find there are a lot of practices, learning practices common with the education for citizenship. It's practically the same pedagogical approach. But there are some specificities in my uh, content related, but, uh, particularly, but uh, that, so there are overlappings. For instance, both share the very concept of empowerment as the key uh, strategy, educational strategy to do with, uh, with human rights education and education for uh, human security. So these are three aspects. I think uh, I, we could reflect on it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, uh, Burza. I have a question and I don't have an answer. What kind of citizenship? Romanian citizenship, European citizenship, Arizona state citizenship, uh, global citizenship, because that is an issue. And maybe here educators have to play a role in order to nuance at least statements like uh, my country first. Sure, so, my country can be first, but could be also alone facing disasters, global disasters. And again, I think our, as educator, as intellectual, we have to discuss, debate, and try to, uh, uh, to, to, to promote a public understanding. There are different layers of citizenship. 
I am proud I am a Romanian citizenship, but I would like to be proud I am a global citizenship and European citizenship. Uh, Betsy, what do you think about uh, the role of education and how, what exactly should we do? Because the question of citizenship is the fact that we cannot grade. In mathematics, we can grade our students. If I, if Betsy, I may... Be Professor Berza, I would kindly like Betsy to, 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 ah, okay. to answer okay. this question. Thank you. Thank you, Remus, and thank you for that introduction a few minutes ago. Um, on the citizenship question, I think it's all of the above, that we are a citizen of our country, of our university, a citizen of the world, and need to address all of those. Um, can, can I go ahead and proceed with some of my comments? Please, please. please. Okay. All right. Um, you know, this is such an important topic, human security, that it needs to be taught, and it needs to be taught not just at the university, it needs to be taught beginning in primary school and secondary school and um, everywhere. Um, there's so much going on, at least in the U.S., on this, and obviously the rest of the world, given this conference and the important things we're talking about, that I want to address an organizational initiative um, that is a national initiative in the U.S. Um, I've done a lot of work with ASCU over the years. ASCU is the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. And this is a membership organization um, of about 400 universities, public universities. Um, we believe that the future of American democracy lies in its state colleges and universities, that it is these students that are going to shape the future of, the, of America and um, so it's important that we do it right. We are the largest, the, the public universities educate first generation students, low income students, black, Latina, indigenous students, transfer students. And so we are not the creme de la creme that students come in at the top of their class and, and leave at the, you know, ready to take over the world. Uh, we're serving the new majority of Americans. So it's very important to get that right. Um, we like to think that these universities are dream machines, that it alters the trajectory of the lives of our students and their families and contributes to a more competitive workforce. So one of the, the projects that ASCU has been doing for many years now, probably close to 20 years, um, in education and citizenship and public participation in human security is the American Democracy Project. And this was created to ensure that all students in public universities receive a quality civic education. We wanna make sure that students are empowered to be engaged and to lead the future of our democracy. It reaches into all areas of academic and student life. It brings together faculty from across disciplines, across those silos and institutions. Um, it gets involved in the curriculum and deliberative dialogue. Some of these national initiatives include, and I'm gonna to have to read some of this list because I can't remember all of them. Uh, global civic literacy, reimagining campus and community partnerships, economic literacy project, deliberative dialogue institute, voter education and engagement, digital polarization, global challenges, political ideology diagnostic, uh, di diagnostic citizen, science for citizens, stewardship of public lands, and the list goes on and on, all of these under the umbrella of the American Democracy Project. We have hundreds of campuses that are focusing on civic engagement, community service, and outreach. So we're creating awareness for millions of students to develop the awareness, knowledge, and skills to be informed and engaged citizens. Each university approaches this a little differently, but you know we've got millions of people involved in any given year. Um, one of these is the ASCU Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement Project. So there's a lot of projects under that. Um, this includes a lot of campus initiatives, voter education, voter registration, professional development, days of reflection, speakers, award programs, and a lot of other things. And one of the interesting award programs, um, it's too late for this year, but it's in its 11th year, and it's called It's Up to Us. Um, and student teams compete 
to consider complex policy problems and to develop initiatives, innovative and equitable solutions and initiatives. Um, they focus on the rising national debt, climate concerns, affordability of higher education, rising health care costs, and they have to propose solutions to this. And so they, they're dealing with the, the competing aspects of policymaking, uh, policy development, fiscal management, political feasibility, and so on. Um, we have a number, I think it's 35 universities that compete each year in this. There's a cash prize for the winning team, in fact, for all of the top five teams. Uh, they come to, they, they are invited to our uh, program on this that we hold every year. And so it's just one example. So we're trying to approach it you know, nationally, but yet it's a grassroots initiative for each university to do what they like. Thank you very much, uh, Betsy. We just, uh, I just saw Ligia Deca joining us and coming from the real life of uh, politics, uh, policies on education, fights for budget and for uh, <laughs> different ideas. I will let Ligia to accommodate a little bit with um, our uh, discussion. And uh, if Claudia uh, would like to have the floor, especially considering that Claudia was not just uh, Minister of Education in a region in Brasilia, but she had the chance to see the global perspective from the World Bank uh, position as a senior um, education uh, uh, leader, uh, education, senior director for education, Claudia. Uh, so first, uh, thank you for inviting me to such an important discussion. Uh, I, I work a lot with what we call in my country basic education, which is primary and secondary education, but I'm located at a university, uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, uh, and I study and research and advise on educational policies. And I'm a strong believer in education for citizenship, uh, in trying to build a safer world. Uh, the world cannot be safe if people hate one another and don't understand, and, and if they don't understand the interconnected uh, communities where they need to be citizens. And responding to your question, Remus, uh, the, uh, that you just posed, uh, I am a citizen of Brazil or I'm a citizen of the globe or I, no, I'm a member of different communities and as such a citizen. Uh, and we need to educate kids to be citizen of their schools, citizen of their city, citizens of their uh, country and citizens of the globe. And it's funny that it was in the 90s that Jacques Delors has established the four pillars of education. He was just at the living just the beginning of Europe as uh, a, a unit. And he said that the European kids need to learn two things that normally are on opposing fields. Learning to be, to be well established with their identity, and at the same time, learning to live together. I do not define, said uh, Monsieur Jacques Delors, my identity as French, as opposite, as the identity of the Germans. So the kid, need, the child needs to learn early on to be a citizen of his or her own country and of Europe and of the planet, which is easy to say and very hard to do because it's easier to hate than to love, especially when we deal with diversity. Uh, so I think that this theme is very important. And uh, quoting another uh, university specialist, Joseph Aoun, 
uh, who wrote a very in intriguing book called uh, Robot Proof Higher Education. He said that we have to develop, be it in primary and secondary education or in universities, the, uh, to, the, uh, to, to, uh, the students to have uh, cultural flexibility, which means understanding his or her own culture, and at the same time being able to appreciate traits of other culture that may be different than his or her own culture, which poses com complicated questions, especially when we talk about democracy. Because should I respect autocracy? Definitely not. But learning that transformation from autocracy to democracy takes time and needs to be built, and education plays a vital role in this, might help uh, a lot. So th those are my my initial words, just to provoke some reflections and be able to understand your own perspective. Uh, just to finalize one final uh, co comment on politics, just to bring my personal perspective, uh, I live in a country where there was a military rule, a military uh, dictatorship. Uh, there was a, a, a difficult but interesting process of redemocratizing beginning in the 1980s. I was myself in jail uh, for being an active student, university student. Uh, I was able to be liberated before the end of the dictatorship. But uh, it is not very easy to learn the importance about the importance of the institutions of democracy and the vital role it plays in building peace and security. Uh, so uh, I'm personally committed to this issue and we just ended the term of a president that was preaching for the return of dictatorship, Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, and he tried to twice to create some conditions for a military coup. Fortunately, uh, he not, not, not only were, was unsuccessful because the militaries that didn't support him in this. And uh, at the end, uh, he's, uh, opponent won't won the elections, which he contests, but that's uh, what happened in the end. Thank you. Those are my initial comments. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, if I may, because I am very proud, Claudia also, if she wants, can be a Romanian citizen, because uh, Claudia has roots to Romania, and unfortunately, her father has to leave Romania in a moment when communists started to take over the country. So thank you, Claudia, yeah. for uh, joining now. Uh, Fernando. Well, thank, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Remus. It's a pleasure to be here. And I really mean appreciate that you have invited me to be part of this panel, which is a pleasure to meet, to meet and uh, colleagues and, and share this time with all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to answer your question about which citizenship, because I think that's crucial. Uh, but on the other hand, I think as, um, as I think it was uh, Claudia who said that, uh, or, or yeah, I think it was Claudia or Bessie, excuse me if I'm wrong, but uh, we belong to different uh, citizenships, that's clear. So one is our national, even our local citizenship, and the others, of course, is the regional one or the global one. And, and we are part of that. And uh, higher education for citizenship, what does it mean? Well, I was thinking of a, a particular issue, for instance, in a country, uh, the United Kingdom. Last year, uh, they passed a law in, in Parliament in the UK, which is entitled uh, Skills and Post-16 Education Act uh, 2022. Uh, what does it, uh, I mean, what's the connection with what we are talking about? Well. 
there is a very clear connection. It is that according to the new British law, um, th there is an encouragement for communities from local to regional communities within the UK to provide education after the year, I mean, uh, uh, 16, uh, so when, when th they are getting into tertiary education, basically, to provide education which is important and relevant for their own communities, from local to regional, national communities. And this issue, uh, which was very polemical in the UK, because there is even uh, some provision in the law uh, to punish those communities, uh, sorry, those institutions which do not provide sufficient education related to the community. You know what I'm talking about. So the labor market, industry, etc. So, of course, this is a polemical issue. But uh, on the other hand, if you look at what we are doing at the European level, so the uh, European higher education area, there are studies and there are committees working in, in, in that. And uh, th there was a document uh, approved in Rome by the ministers in, in the year 2020, which basically says that a higher education should be, and all of us agree on that, I'm sure, a lifelong uh, option. Uh, what we know as, uh, I mean, this uh, lifelong education, uh, education for the whole life, that educa higher education is not only for, for I mean, the cohort of students uh, being 18 to 25, for instance, uh, but that uh, people who have a profession and want to get back and, and, and get extra training when they are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, etc., uh, the uh, institutions of higher education should provide for that. And well, that is an, another issue that is global nowadays, but uh, we are insisted on that uh, at the European level. And particularly uh, that document approved in Rome talks about an inclusive approach to involve wider communities in higher education. Inclusive approach to include wider communities means not only the academic community, which means further social levels that includes industry, of course, and jobs, etc. We cannot forget that there is a very interesting study. I have the uh, data here. The World Economic Forum report in the year 2020 said that for 2025, which is just around the corner, uh, there will be, uh, they say, 85 million jobs that will be displaced by a shift uh, in the division of labor, basically, as we know, new technologies. Uh, so we have new technologies replacing uh, many people, in fact. And well, that issue uh, is certainly a, an issue for higher education to provide and, and to uh, to, I mean, to think about it. Uh, and then also another region in which I'm uh, very closely interested, and, and you mentioned that in, in your introduction, Remus, is of course uh, Latin America and the, and the Caribbean. And the UNESCO has worked through the institution that they have there, ESALC, in, in a program which is entitled The Futures of Higher Education. They published a report last year uh, in preparation for the UNESCO conference uh, the World uh, uh, UNESCO Conference in, in Barcelona. And that report is entitled 10 Access for Thinking About Tomorrow, uh, Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean. And they insist again, first of all, uh, on a crucial issue, which is that all education, and that includes uh, higher education, should be uh, interpreted as a, I quote, social, public good, a human and universal right, and a duty of the state in the region. And uh, this means that uh, experts in higher education who have been uh, examining the regional needs uh, uh, present a list of 10 axes, uh, 10 um, um, uh, lines of uh, development of higher education in the region. And basically they uh, coincide with many others in the rest of the world. So I, I'm going to give only the titles of the 10 axes. Uh, one is the impact of COVID-19, uh, of course, on higher education in Latin America, but that of course could be uh, applied to the whole world. The other is 
uh, the connection between higher education and the uh, sustainable development goals, the United Nations uh, SDGs. The other is inclusion in higher education, and that is connected with, uh, I think, very interestingly with the first issue uh, that Professor Butzia uh, presented, and particularly the responsibility. That's something I would like to talk about if we have time later on. Then the other is data and uh, knowledge production, which is basic in modern society and in economics. The other is the academic mobility in higher education, crucial to offer our students, our graduates, a, a real, um, uh, um, I mean, um, a training for their future. A, a, a sixth one would be international cooperation to enhance all sorts of synergies, and that uh, is uh, again, crucially uh, related to a global uh, understanding of uh, citizenship. The other, of course, is uh, financing higher education everywhere in the world. The other is quality and relevance of programs. Uh, some people have said many universities are now irrelevant to what our students really need. Uh, some of us are teaching the same things uh, as, as we did 50 years ago. And we, we cannot go on like that because the world has changed dramatically in this period and universities should change accordingly. Uh, and the other is of course, the governance of higher education. This is clearly connected with re responsibility, which is a crucial issue of our, our education for citizenship. And finally, the last one is uh, preparing for the future, uh, for the futures in the plural uh, of higher education and of the world, uh, because our students now, uh, they will be living in a completely different world in 20 or 30 years time. Um, I, I don't want to take more time, uh, Raimuso, but I just wanted to, I mean, answer, trying to answer your question with the diversity of what citizenship uh, is uh, globally. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, before to introduce uh, Ligia, we have a question which I think uh, is very uh, important to try to answer. Uh, Len Anderson is asking uh, what exactly we mean by citizenship. Isn't it related specifically to the, to the legal status of citizens in a nation state? You can be a conscious member of a community and humanity, but is that citizenship? Why I started this discussion with um, um, education and citizenship? Because um, if you look at definitions of education in different countries, for a long period of time, more than 100 years, more or less, you'll find in these national definitions of the concept of education, you will find three pillars. One pillar will be personal development. So education is for personal development of each kid. The second one is labor market. And the third one is citizenship. And uh, somehow maybe the crisis of education, there are many sources, but maybe one of the reasons for different crises of education in different countries it's exactly the fact that we don't understand why and how we are educating our kids. And uh, this is one component of my answer. The second one, in Europe, for example, we already use the citizenship term for national citizenship, European citizenship, and has a legal status, the concept of European citizenship, but has also a symbolical status. The concept, I am European, you are, I'm Romanian, but also I'm European. But I would like to be also a, a global citizen. And that is what Professor Burza said, citizenship uh, is uh, uh, associated to rights and obligations towards state. But why we don't have rights and obligations towards the globe? Again, I don't, I'm not uh, saying uh, this is uh, the correct answer, it's my opinion, but let me introduce to you a global citizen. Ligia Deca used to be student while I was deputy minister uh, for higher education many years ago, and she was 
a Romanian citizen because she was a leader of students, Romanian students, students union. So we were supposed to fight because generally students are fighting with the ministry, but we have we didn't fight. She was also an European citizen because uh, she uh, was elected president of the European Student Union twice for two years. And she's also a global citizen because her academic area, it's international dimension of education with a PhD on this topic in Luxembourg. For a couple of years, she led the Romanian, the Romanian sorry, European Bologna Process Secretariat, being the youngest ever doing this, not in Romania, but in uh, uh, Europe. She served as advisor of the president of Romania for uh, eight years. And today she is doing education. Now she is in the building of the government because she just left the cabinet meeting, uh, fighting because all good ministers have to fight for introducing a new legislation on the education uh, area. Ligia, thank you for making time to join uh, our uh, session. And I think considering the time, we'll conclude with you. So you have Thank seven, eight minutes. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished director, dear Remus, um, dear uh, fellow panelists. Um, it's my honor to be invited to this panel. And I must confess, um, it's a pleasure for me to um, talk about the role of higher education when it comes to building um, citizenship at any level and also the role of higher education when it comes to, um, in general, um, upholding democratic societies. Um, indeed, I was just in the in the cabinet meeting where uh, we launched for in interministerial approval the, the new laws for both um, primary and secondary education, but also for higher education. Um, as Ram was mentioned, I wore many hats uh, during my um, well years uh, working for education, and I remember some time ago my role as a student representative and how it was based on this idea that uh, if we have democratic universities, then we will have democratic societies. And that's why, as a student representative, I remember always fighting for um, students having a voice, a real voice, because if they were used to having a voice in the university regarding their own studies, um, they would then go on, uh, more often than not, uh, to be very much involved when it comes to the, the life of their countries, uh, societies, and so on. Um, I also think the, the role of students in a university does not extend solely to their um, apprenticeship. Um, it also has to do with the, the, their contribution to the role of universities for preparation for democratic citizenship as the Council of Europe coined it. I think um, students have this way of going outside from the, from the university and being involved in various projects, extracurricular activities, hobbies, and so on, and then coming back and bringing the life of society, if I can use this term inside the university, um, together with the, the, the debates that society carries on. Um, and then I think the university has this very important role of allowing that safe space for debate and, and um, finalizing one's own character and value system. I also saw many interesting ideas in the European context um, lately. I think we've talked a little bit or um, when talking about regional initiatives, we've mentioned European university initiative and how one of the biggest parts of that initiative is how to create um, a European identity, so to speak. So universities across Europe from various countries with various profiles are linking together in an enhanced form of cooperation with the ultimate goal of creating European campuses. Now, I don't think they will be physical. I think they will be rather symbolical and they will be substantiated by various cooperation programs, exchanges, um, common approaches when it comes to the curricula, and also um, a, a, an excellent way 
of having a dialogue between different national higher education systems. And here, I think that I saw this in many European university applications as I was part of the, the group of experts some time ago that evaluated some of these applications. Many, many networks of universities proposed so-called democracy innovation labs where universities would actually use their academic communities and gather the private sector, public authorities, NGOs, and debate the, the problems of their communities and of communities of their partner universities and try to find solutions and then um, spill over the solutions to the society. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting development and it's an interesting development backed up by European money. And I think um, we will probably see more of these approaches because if we look at the past years, our global challenges can only be met by global solutions. And um, I think you can only generate global solutions through networks of very good people, which are usually working in universities. Um, finally, I would like to mention the Educated Romania vision building project. The president of Romania, a teacher himself, um, when he um, was elected in his first mandate, he said that um, a sustainable Romanian society for the future can only be founded on a very solid ground when it comes to education. So he bet against the style in which uh, public policies were developed in Romania until then. Um, basically, they were expert-based policies. A group of experts would develop a law and then you know, the, the society would be consulted and then it would be passed or assumed. Uh, by the political majority. He said that society needs to discuss, gain ownership, come to a common conclusion, and then um, solutions can be launched. Because without ownership of educational reforms, very few actually come to fruition. So he started this process called Educated Romania with a debate with the whole society for a whole year, with everyone involved, various instruments, starting from how we want the society to look like and then seeing how education can help us build that society. This process lasted for six years. It was the longest and uh, most um, um, grounded on, on various uh, consultation instruments, like for example, uh, Delphi foresight exercises, consultations, um, expert work with the OECD and so on. Um, and what was generated was a vision together with a, a series of technical reports that are, were then transformed into the current uh, laws that we are now trying to pass through the government and then send to the parliament. Why is this interesting? It's interesting because um, in 2016, education was talked about, but not as a main topic. It wasn't a main topic of conversation. Elections were uh, fought and won uh, over other subjects, not necessarily education. Now, education is a center subject. And regardless of how you know, political parties differ on the solutions, I think everyone agrees on the problem and on the need to solve them. And I think this is a huge step, step forward because in the end, um, if we don't have strong and democratic educational systems, we won't have strong and democratic societies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ligia, for uh, your uh, presentation. Uh, yes, as a Romanian, Professor Cesar Burza also know very well. In Romania, we have debated uh, even in a very effervescent and somehow conflictual way. Even today, we have some topics uh, heavily discussed, but that is good because you hear different opinions and also you clarify. For example, I, I, I assessed yesterday uh, a little bit, what are the topics still debated in conflict? Three, four, five, but six years ago, there were 50. So at least we clarified many uh, subjects, many ideas, and also we can, uh, I am optimistic, we'll see results, Never you have a perfect law, never. And also a perfect law today would be an unperfect law to tomorrow because tomorrow you'll have other challenges. So uh, this is a continuing process and uh, at least we have succeeded to learn how to go through this uh, process. The issues you've raised regarding global citizenship, regarding education and multilateralism, uh, uh, regarding 
the interaction between different levels of citizenship really present a critical dilemma for citizens <laughs> with our uh, uh, our conf uh, sometimes unfortunately conflicting sense of allegiance uh, to to who we belong to and what group we belong to and where our loyalties should be. So you presented, I think, very clearly a central dilemma of our times and rightly recognized that without education, there's no way for us to, uh, education has to be the solution. And that's a very challenging task, uh, a complex task for educators to uh, address also because it's not a specialized topic for special uh, for specialization where we need a few people who know what global citizenship is. <laughs> we need everybody to understand this and uh, our system is not yet geared to present that. That's one of the main themes of the our conference and our work on education in this campaign on human security is human security is not a specialization. <laughs> It's something that applies to everybody, and there's something that all of us need to understand in order to, for our own security, as well as to contribute to the security of the community and the world. And this discussion is of, of, of that order and type very much. So uh, I thank you and Ramus for convening such a wonderful panel. Thank you all for joining us.